Hi, my name is Leah Fredman, and today we have a panel about um, overcoming challenges in the game analytics pipeline. And before we introduce ourselves, I just wanted to you know, give you a quick overview as to what do we mean when we say so this here is uh, obviously a very textbook-ish type of definition. So game analytics is the process of discovering and communicating patterns and data towards solving problems in business or conversely predictions for supporting enterprise decision management, driving action, and or improving performance. So there's a lot of information here, right? And basically what this is telling us is that uh, it's using data as a toolkit and it's going to help us understand user behavior. And it's going to help us understand user behavior either um, you know, as players, so are, 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 are um, levels too hard, are people dying too much, or you know, more in terms of customers, so revenue and uh, things like that. And uh, so, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, so, all right, so. Oh, sure. Hi. Uh, Oh, I'm never good with these. Uh, I'm Matthew Weiss. Um, I'm a used to be an academic for a long while, a data scientist for Play Research, um, or a consulting firm that provides usability research services as well as now analytics services to the games industry. Um, you might have seen Sebastian and Graham and other folks talking. Uh, I used to be at PlayStation where I did data science for a while, and also at Volition on the Saints Row and Agents of AM titles. Before that, I was an academic. Out of Penn State, going at New Lines. How's it going? Uh, my name is Reed Bonaparte. I'm here on behalf of uh, Riot Games. I'm from the Insights Discipline, which I co-lead with David Pavlos. The, uh, the Insights Discipline at Riot is responsible for um, combining quantitative and qualitative and data science techniques uh, in order to provide kind of like 360 view on player behavior and the things that we need to know in order to make League of Legends and other experiences that we provide for players the most compelling that we can. Uh, we cover gameplay analytics, um, similar to some of the stuff you saw in uh, Nathan Blau's talk earlier. We cover uh, some of the business concerns, um, similar to the conversation earlier uh, from our friends at Google. And then we also do a ton of corporate strategy work and I kind of help organize the entire effort. And my name is Nick Vermeer. I work for Glitch. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in Minnesota that develops games, publishes games, and we also do a lot of education. Uh, so we work with uh, trying to analyze how people are learning in games, and a lot of that is built around analytics, tracking which behaviors people are demonstrating, how does that tie to behaviors outside of the game, um, and more entertainment games as well. So we've been building a little analytics team that is me and one other person with using Unity Analytics a lot. So, different than these two who are more AAA and much closer to the indie side. Okay, so the first uh, topic that we are going to be discussing is communication of methods and results. And the first question that um, we're going to talk about is how do you communicate your results to an executive, developer, or just you know someone else as your stakeholder? Well, for me, this varies a lot based on who, like whether I'm talking to a developer, a stakeholder, or my my co-founder partner, who is the executive in this case. Um, with stakeholders, I started out building very like academic report-ish things that felt very formal, like a, a nice solid deliverable as like a consulting firm almost. Um, but they honestly didn't read them. So it turned into much shorter, shorter types of reporting, uh, presentations, getting away from graphs, just talking about what the statistics meant from the data analytics side. Um, developers, I work with a developer who has like a math physics background and is very, very skeptical of statistics. So it's getting them on board each time with whatever we're doing that like we are doing good statistics. It's not just a bunch of BS. Um, and the executive I work with is very curious about my methods and how I'm approaching collecting each piece of data. So she's probably the most critical of all of my work out of the three on that slide, but it is a negotiation every time how and what that person wants and how they will evaluate my reports at least. 
So yeah, over the course of my time at Riot, we've dealt with a whole bunch of different types of stakeholders, um, which range from the artists who just want to know, do players rock my shit, to uh, senior executives who are like, tell me more about deep rabbit hole of the information, right? Like you find people across the entire spectrum. But the one thing that I've found to be universally consistent across these audiences is that they really want your opinion on what they should do. The, everything else that you've done, all of the statistics, all of the research should lend itself to a conclusion, a recommendation that they can take and implement if it makes sense to them. Which comes to my second point, which is figure out how they make sense, right? Um, whichever language they're speaking, however their kind of like cognitive schema works that helps them make decisions, that's the language that you use to communicate with them. Because if they don't or are unfamiliar or are unwilling to become familiar with the nuances of your delivery and nuances of the methodologies that you've employed, um, a 30 minute stakeholder meeting is not a time to do intro to stata. Like it's just not, like that just, that's, that's not a good use of time. So instead, speak the language that they're looking for. You know, one of the things I noticed when I switched to a contracting role away from being like an embedded or in studio role is that suddenly people become much more aware of the value of time. Um, <laughs> we used to joke a lot of the time at PlayStation and elsewhere that it's a bit paradoxical that sometimes someone doesn't want to spend $500 on a piece of software, but they have no problem scheduling a meeting with 35 people that lasts an hour. And so mathematically, that doesn't make any sense, right? We tend to think super mathematically. So the kinds of questions I've gotten are very different in a contracting role than they ever were in a AAA role. Clients tend to come to us with very discreet questions. They already are engaged because they're, they're paying us money. Um, so they come with questions. They have the idea, like, I need to know this, this, this about my players. And sometimes those questions are quite misinformed. And I think this is very standard for the research community generally. Sort of, do people like our game? You know, those broad questions you get. Um, there's also the, the problem that I feel like um, sometimes we benefit from the fact that I feel like people believe there's power in numbers. Uh, that somehow if I give you a percentage with a confidence interval, there's somehow more validity to that than there is to like a, like a qualitative finding. Which I think is super problematic because it leads us to be very easily misleading. Um, so I'll say with communicating results, I have to sometimes uh, talk people down from believing that what I'm giving them is like fact. 100% fact. Um, this completely different angle. When working in a more embedded role, people were much more likely to ask me just curiosity questions. Show me how many people are using, and like you say, deep, insane rabbit hole. Um, yeah, so it, it's never been a problem in a contracting role, honestly. If anything, it's usually trying to discourage people from taking the numbers and absolutely running to the bank with them. So, you have another microphone. I'm sorry. I do. Ah. Um, just to build upon uh, what you guys are saying for a little bit, so I know Nick was uh, talking about how you know his um, experience was that he's learned over time to make uh, shorter and shorter um, sorry right reports, and I know that's the theme that came up earlier today when people were speaking about that, um, and it was interesting for me you know to hear you say that you kind of have to talk people down because you know we see a lot of time you know. It's, data-driven thing, people sure. think that there's this magic in numbers, and so I was just curious, how does that translate for you into report writing or yeah, graphs and everything? It depends entirely on the um, client. I think it's similar to, um, you know, what Nick was saying, you know, and, and, and then again, to Rudy's point, speaking to the language they expect, right? Um, there are some clients who engage uh, play research because of the history with the user research side. And then the analytics side is new, and it's a bit like the Jones next door thing. We're like, hey, we know other mobile developers are doing that. We should probably hire him too. And I end up coming on, and then I have kind of an uphill battle, right? Because now I'm proving the value of the thing I do. So those reports are a little more in depth, a little more um, um, mathematic. They have sort of more numeracy behind them. On the other hand, executives that are used to an analytics team and they want an external set of eyes. Those are extremely short. I mean, it's a page, these four things are broken, you can improve efficiency here, you know, you can switch to this cloud service to promote data security. They're very clear recommendations and very short. So yeah, it definitely um, depends on who I'm giving that report to. So yeah, I'm sorry, I guess that's really a super vague answer, but yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Reports haven't actually gotten shorter. <laughs> it just happens, sorry, bro. Um, what actually happens is that the front end of the report gets shorter. The first 
five, six slides, that's, that's where the magic is, that's where the recommendation is, that's where the thing I want you to do is. The thing that players said that they're looking for from you as a developer, that's where that is. The appendix is getting longer and longer and longer. Yeah, and so it's like, I have one slide up front that says, hey, we need to adjust the champion in this way. And then there's 42 slides in the back that's like, all the player feedback, all of the uh, analysis on attack damage and everything else is all in the back. But the slide up front is just one or two. Yeah. No, it's, it's important to have, I mean, as the sh reports get shorter, it's still nice to have that appendix, but it's, it's like your methods section almost. Like, yeah, I did my due diligence with the data and I have all of my analyses that could address this question from the stakeholder in this way. So, yeah, it's just not giving them all of that detail up front or they'll just shut down and be like, what are you talking about? HLM? Why, what, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> yeah. I think I learned at some point that they call it an executive summary because summary for executives sounds a little insulting. Okay, uh, this next one is asking whether we should be teaching both our coworkers and clients about the methods we use, right? I think kind of goes to what you were talking about, how there's this idea that numbers, data, is kind of like this magical thing, um, and is that kind of the view that we want to have for analytics, or do we want to be able to go more into details and explain all of the nitty gritty, or is there some sort of happy middle ground there. I have myriad internal fears about this, so I have, <laughs> I have kind of like a, um, a cognitive dissonance because I, on one hand, I definitely believe in like educating people and giving people tools to make smart data-driven decisions totally on their own. In fact, I believe it to the point that it's literally the sales pitch I give every time we're selling this stuff. So you can, we're gonna teach you how to take the data and run with it, but on the other hand, that some part of me does see that as like giving a six-year-old the hedge clippers and be like, hey, go, go trim the bushes, nothing bad will happen, it'll be fine. Um, in the past, we've had, uh, at, in my more embedded roles, issues where um, someone who had a sort of a, you know, like a, a, a novice, is a good word, grasp on statistics or mathematics, was asked to find something for an executive and trying to uh, be sort of diligent and perspicacious, they went to the SQL server and pulled the numbers and then gave it to the executive and then the executive makes a decision and it's a really stupid decision. And then that person gets in trouble because Lord knows they gave them the numbers. Um, so sometimes I, sometimes I do want to hide exactly how I got things, but at the same time I feel kind of dirty doing that. I'd be curious to hear your guys' input on it. Yeah, I mean, not to go like 100% fortune cookie with it, but when the student is ready, the teacher should appear. Um, and what I mean by that is that like, we should be able to engage our partners across the organization when they're ready to actually learn about what we do and incorporate it into their work loop. We saw in a couple of the other presentations, particularly the one on, uh, on Fortnite, in terms of like how they integrated the user experience research into the development loop. That means they knew something about what that did, what that did how long it took, et cetera, et cetera. It was part of the working loop. And in order to do that, in order to grok that, like, they actually have to have, have some sense of understanding in terms of what you do. Um, and that's really where we want to be in both uh, game analytics and uh, user research perspective. It's part of the core working loop of the team that's creating these experiences for players. And so when people are willing to learn and willing to dedicate the time, I think we should be ready to prepare them. It's when they're like, hey, I just need to know how to do this one little thing in isolation um, that they run the risk of knocking over my vertical cluster, and then I'm like, no. <laughs> I have dual feelings about this as well. Like, it's, it's tricky on a smaller team to have everyone trained on all the methods they would need to know in order to effectively evaluate the data. But the tools are becoming more and more available, like Tableau is easier to use, Unity Analytics has a very accessible dashboard that whoever is running the dev team has access to, whether you want, it, want them to or not, um, at least in my organization. And we've had a lot of discussions about, like, this, this data doesn't quite mean this, so I'd be hesitant to, like, take that away. Maybe we should, we should verify it from the dashboard, because they don't know how they're, how they're calculating it. But this is the problem with using third-party tools. 
Um, but on the, at the same time, like it's nice to have their perspective because they have a lot of insight into the data that I don't necessarily have since I am not designing the game. So the more I can get them involved in the process, the happier I am. But it is like it, it's just hard to get them the tools that are applicable and easily easily usable. So that's my struggle. And one of the interesting things that comes up when you start to talk about third-party applications, um, which we at Riot provide to uh, pretty much everybody in the company, in terms of like Tableau access, for example, is that you end up in this like UX meta game where you're designing the report about the design in such a way that you don't have your your players uh, end up down like adverse paths that lead them to experiences you don't want them to have, like bad conclusions. And so you, we actually do spend a lot of time thinking about like how am I going to design this dashboard in such a way that you pull away the things that matter and you don't pull away things that like are not valid conclusions based on the work that we did. Yeah, this reminds me a little bit of the earlier. Um, there's a gentleman talking about balance in uh, Hearthstone, right? Um, Alexandria, I'm going to say he's in here somewhere, I'm sure. Anyway, the, uh, that there's one very interesting interpretation in that that just reminded me completely of this topic, right? It's that uh, when they talked about balancing the warrior and, the, and the, when the games, um, excuse me, when the cards were picked relative to the win, because the deck is inherently slower, there's kind of an endemic thing that biases how those numbers look. So that, that's one of the things that scares me so much about letting the, letting the methods out is that you know, adding 10 numbers together and dividing by 10 to get an average is exceptionally easy, but looking at that in the context of the larger, like how does this number actually, what are the things going in here, what are the extraneous variables, is, is kind of completely more nuanced. So it's, yeah. Randover. Good one. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, based on what I'm hearing, it seems like perhaps there's, um, this difference between if you're in an embedded role versus not. Because if you're in an embedded role and you're going to be working with the same people over and over, then at the point where they are ready to be educated about you know statistics and the value of it and what questions to be asked, then in the long run you're going to be getting your value out of that. But if you are working with a company that you may not be repeatedly interacting with and you teach them you know how to do X, you never know if next they're just going to try and you know, force X onto every other piece of data that they get because you're not there to kind of see what's going on more. Yeah, I completely agree. We, um, in the more embedded roles, absolutely. I mean, you are, even as you research professionals, I mean, you're around, you're there, you make yourself available, you can ask questions, you can, you can provide clarity, you can provide context, you, you're, you're as much an educator as you are a colleague, right? Because there's something you know that they don't, just like there's something they know that you don't. Right, and that there's a there's a trade of information there where you both become better for it. I think um, this reminds me of that, and I mentioned this to you in our preparatory call that we had one individual game designer at a company that makes a large MOBA that isn't Riot. Um, it's not Riot. I'm serious. It's not. I'm just flattering him. Ah, that added to when I was telling you about the averages. So they had there's a series of champions from which you could select, right? And so they assigned each one a number to so that you're able to actually use it. And in things like SPSS and Tableau, everything has to have a Anyway, so they took all these, um, um, you know, champions. Say Timo is one, and Akali is two, whatever. They added them all together, and then they divided an average to get the to get the champion that was most used. So just let that sink in for a minute. That would be the equivalent of adding all of our hair colors together and dividing them to get an average hair color on the stage. It makes absolutely no sense. And this is just this is taking a method and running with it in a context that is completely inappropriate. It's a it's a fear that I always have. Anyway. So what's the average of Ash and Timo, one? And two, in the hair color example, do I count for zero? Or like, how does that math work? Like, how does that math work? Yes, I will answer that one, no. no but, and you know, I think what you're saying, right, it's like, it's not what you have, it's basically knowing how to use it. 100%. Is that a read? <laughs> Carry on. Okay, so on the next topic we have a game analytics and game development process, and the first question that we wanted to talk about was when analytics are most useful in the game development process, pre, mid, post, uh, or production, and you know, I might add to that depending on um, 
your opinions is uh, in addition to one, if you think that they are useful in uh, you know, more than just one time, uh, what types of analytics do you think uh, that we should be focused on? And not necessarily you know, which kinds of tests, but more uh, where should your general effort be? Okay, so all of the above, the correct answer is, what's that, D, all of the above? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, let's say you're in pre, right? Uh, so you're in this discovery process trying to figure out, like, where's the fun in my game? Like, what is it, what is the loop that we're going to put players through where they come out the other side? Like, hell yeah, I want to get on that ride again. Where, where, what is that? That is a place where we should be doing some analytics and some research to understand what drives that loop, why people get off the ride, and how we can get them back on. And we should start to size that out. We can also um, start doing market analytics at that point to figure out, okay, we've made this ride. How many people are going to get on this thing? Is this actually a viable product? That, that's pretty, and that's totally worth doing. When you're in mid, that's when you're starting to do like some really intensive uh, player testing and really starting to understand if this game is balanced, if as we build out systems around the core gameplay loop, are they uh, multiplicative of that, of that player fun, or are they um, basically like multiplying it by a fraction? Um, and then when you're in post, now you're talking about like video games as a piece of software that is a like long-term live service. And at that point, a lot of the core mechanics of um, software as a service analytics come in, in terms of new player acquisition, retention, churn rates, how do we keep this thing up, alive, and well, and fresh for players for as long as we possibly can? We have a little bit different process, just because we're a little bit smaller. Like, our, our pre-production process is primarily, like, paper prototyping. So it's hard. It would be very hard for us to get analytics in the paper. Um, but we start in a, and like doing market analytics early on, as you said. Um, not necessarily me, that would be the other co-founder, just doing market research and analytics, um, not necessarily behavioral analytics and such, where you're tracking individual behaviors in the game and such. Um, but by mid, like we're getting in our analytics hooks at least to track different behaviors, making sure they're acting the way we want them to, um, just general testing with that, and then post, yeah, it's full, full on implementation of analytics. We do a little bit different where we have to deliver our analytics, even just the raw data, to our partners sometimes because they're part of like a government contract and they need to provide the data to a data bank in the like for the Department of Education or something like that. So we have a little bit more of a partnership at that point where it's not a software as a service necessarily, but a dump of data that has been designed for you to do research on. So yeah, it's, it's similar to the user research spectrum, right? Like when you say user research, that's not one thing. It's like a series of techniques and toolboxes. And it's exactly the same with us in that sense that, I mean, even from very early pre-launch, uh, you know, even if you and I were, were at a pub and we said, hey, we're going to make a MOBA, we could very quickly, um, using NPD data or Twitter scrubbing or some kind of like Python web crawler, we could figure out what the actual market of individuals that are interested in this is to a broad amount of like what the common characteristics of things they're discussing are. There's some, there's some interesting exploratory stuff that you can do early on that of course isn't of massive impact, but it helps you make a, a more informed decision about early design choices. Um, and of course, in mid, this is like, you know, we'd sort of put in all our telemetry, we work with designers to make sure that the things that they want in their core intention are being measured and that those are accessible to them immediately and in an actionable time frame. And then, like you say, in post, it's churn, monetization, very standard stuff. So, like races, there is no wrong time or no wrong way to. Like races. Like races, yes. Yeah. Right? But that was an American expression. One, one thing that's like particular to the phrasing of the question, most useful would probably be pre. And, and here's why, here's, a, here's how we think about it, right? We think that in order to make a game, you don't necessarily need a researcher or an analyst. You need an engineer to code it. You probably need an artist to put some graphics to it. And you need somebody to design the core gameplay loop. For indie studios, it's like multiple people wearing the same hat. Um, you do not actually need somebody to send out a survey or <laughs> do a massive SQL poll or build a massive market research model. You do not actually need that. So the value that we add is supposed to provide some sort of benefit above the expected value of the game. Right? And 
that, that delta between the expected trajectory of a title and the trajectory given a better understanding of what works and what doesn't um, is much more prevalent the earlier that you get in the process. At that point, it just becomes straight graph geometry. Like, if you're waiting till like post to start actually doing hardcore or analytics or research on your game, a lot of those like core elements of the gameplay loop, many game systems, market launch stuff, that's all been locked in, right? It's too late to turn the ship. And if you've got this Titanic of a game, then there's not a whole lot you can do about it except, I don't know, pick up the fiddle. But like, if there's, if you get in really, really early, if you get in really, really early and start engaging with your, uh, with your design and executive team super early in the process, you can just not take that same route and have a wonderful voyage. I don't know why I took this. Yes. <laughs> so do your analytics early, but um, you know, still do them throughout the entire time, uh, even if you're fiddle playing. I think a lot of those. Um, just to plug myself a little bit, I think a lot of those. Please. I think a lot of those people who have a game already can still benefit, even if it's already out there. I don't think you're necessarily in fiddle territory. I mean, it depends on a lot of things, but but like you like the game, yeah, exactly. But in terms of um, anything that you know has a has a ongoing software as a service type uh, model, at any point can benefit from an analytics professional. I mean, period. The level of benefit is certainly way higher if we get in pre, so to that extent, I agree with you. But I, I don't think it ever, it's like an asymptote at zero, I don't think it ever gets to like, we're worthless. Yeah. If only for my own. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, right, a lot of times, even if you had certain expectations based on knowledge um, or research, you don't 100% of the time have the end result play out, you know, the way that you expected it to. And so obviously I think, right, in that um, type of situation, it would be pretty invaluable to a very serious analytics get done later on as well. And for our second question in this topic, uh, we have how do game analytics fit into the more traditional games user research process? Are they part of games user research? Are they important? I mean, I know we like games user research because we're all here. Any thoughts? Yeah, so this is a data triangulation question, right? I mean, uh, from anything you're looking at, we want to look at this like signs and symptoms, right? To some extent, um, analytics professionals look for signs, while user research professionals look for symptoms. These are things that players are physically able to report or able to somehow tell a user research professional or, or, or tell whether with their mouths or with their body language or with responses to a, a research professional. And to that extent, we see things on the back end that are maybe not apparent to someone who has to watch 50 people. You know, it's impossible, or at least a waste of human time, to sit and have a clicker for every death that happens, and to have a clicker in the other hand for every time you steal a car in Grand Theft Auto, or these things can easily be offloaded away from someone who's, who's invested in something completely different. But we form two sides of a holistic view of what I think is a really um, total look into the player experience. Um, uh, to that extent, most of the user research methods that are employed can at least be, if not assisted by analytics data, at least uh, um, um, further informed. So, you know, we may be able to tell you that a certain level has a certain percentage of all deaths in the game. And even if that doesn't directly affect how you do user research, it at least gives you a starting point of where to start looking for problems if you only know vaguely there is a problem. We do it all side by side, but it is, again, a small studio. Like, me and the other person that's specifically to research both do analytics, both do quality of research, we both do, like, we're trying to offload clickers, yeah, yeah, or behavioral coding from video, like, we don't have time for that, so adding in analytics makes our lives easier. Um, so anything else, yeah, one more tool is just above and beyond what we, what we can do, so. Yeah, it's just completely integrated. Yeah, we, we definitely do both. Um, analytics for us tells you what players are doing, user research tells you why, and then in some different studies for different things that we're looking at, user research will tell you what players are doing, and analytics will tell you how prevalent, how prevalent that behavior is. In all of these cases, and there are a myriad more, we learn about what uh, the player experience looks like and the drivers behind it 
from a kind of more multimodal perspective than just what one toolkit or one uh, kind of set of expertise can provide individually. And I think that's the strength of kind of bringing the two disciplines together. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, right, um, both in games, user research, and in analytics, we're just trying to get these data points of people's behaviors and what they're doing, and it's more of a question of um, you know, how many of these data points we can get depending on what we're looking at and then how useful they can be to answer different types of questions. And so really I think that uh, you'd kind of be shortchanging yourself if you just really focused only on one or the other and it's really great to be able to triangulate the data that way as everyone's been saying. Yeah. Sorry, so excited there. So, thank you for joining us, and if anyone has any questions, we would love to receive some. Oh, good, the lights are coming. Okay. Uh, Hello. Um, so, when you're talking about post-production analytics, um, how would you... A lot of what you were referring to was living games, so as they progress past first release. Um, how would you feel about static games that aren't adapting? After the release, they are fully released. What about the analytics in that, in that sense? Do you find that information important, or should that be something answered beforehand um, in terms of whenever you're looking at the data? So post-launch analytics are useful for a business case, obviously, on something that's software as a service. It's got a really easily understandable thing. Our bread and butter is selling people a repeat buy-in to a product, and knowing why, how, when, how often, and the predictive behaviors that lead to someone buying that is really important to understanding the core business model. That aside, um, you know what you might call traditional, and I hate the word, uh, games that have like a premium price that come out, they're purchased, they're experienced once, you think heavy rain, that kind of thing, and then you, you put it down and you don't play it anymore. They still have value in analytics, right? Because of course, if we look at something like um, um, serial games, like Saints Row, uh, you know, when we start gathering data about Saints Row 3, we know the kinds of behaviors people are engaged in, we can rank the kinds of popularity of the different kinds of distractions we put in those games, we can rank the popularity of items, weapons, we can have exploratory data about which parts of the city are most interesting, and these inform the next iteration in that series. Um, on top of that, they also inform DLC packages. They inform um, our design choices. They're part of our post-mortem system where our design talent learns about the kinds of things they sort of did and what worked well and what didn't. Um, I think there's myriad use for it in, in a more traditional sort of premium fire and forget uh, game as well. It also helps us with community management, um, cheat detection. If we form, for example, a baseline of experience to level 70 or 90 or 1,000 or whatever it is in World of Warcraft now, and somebody deviates dramatically from that, and there's that like far enough away, in a machine learning and AI sense, we can very quickly determine, like, uh-oh, something weird is happening here, and we find our loot cave, right? Um, so there are lots of ways that that actually does still apply. Yeah, a lot of it is just informing the next game. Like, if it is a premium game, taking the lessons you learn from that game, because it's essentially like the final test is going out there, seeing how people respond to the game, and applying that to the next game. But, I mean, you can just do a lot of testing as well and figure out, like, did this work for the designers? Like, did our challenge ramp up as we expected based on our soft launch if it's a mobile game or something like that, even though it's a smaller sample, did our, did our hypothesis work out or not, so. I'd also like to add that I'm really pro open data sets, just as a general concept. I know the games industry is obviously really quite quiet about what we're working on, and we do keep our cards close to our collective chests, but um, freely releasing, if you can, your data to other folks. I mean, if you're talking like, this is open world data from Saints Row 3, here you are would be a really interesting way for us to collectively learn more about those kinds of games. Because the power of data is once it gets big, we start learning about what things are and are not generalizable across genres, which is, which is awesome. But we do, you know, we're not there yet, but I'd love to be. Anyway. I just have one more question. Sure. So what do you, how do you archive all of the data? Because if you're taking that information and you're saving it for later, 
future iterations? Where do you keep it? How do you make sure that you're holding yourself accountable to not making any design uh, flaws based off of what you've already learned? So that has varied wildly at every studio I've ever seen or worked at. So there's not really great standardization there, to be totally honest. Or if there is, it's very well hidden from me. Um, at Studio A, we have tables in database A, and then when we're done with that game, we close that schema, and we open database B with this schema, and we move on. And we have joins and cross database joins that we can do if we want to experiment longitudinally. Um, other studios, I mean, I have seen everything from literally paper records to Excel files that are 500 megabytes to, yeah, it varies wildly, and we're in desperate need of um, um, standardization. I think cloud services are moving us there slowly. We use Unity Analytics, which is just built into the Pro subscription. So if you, I think it's like 125 bucks a month. All of your data is archived for like that. Right? Yep. Yeah, it's all stored in the cloud. You basically write requests for like a chunk of your data from a certain game with like these variables, and you can go back and request it whenever until Unity goes away, and then hopefully. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. We talked a bit about getting analytics redevelopment, and I was wondering how you'd go about getting that and what that looks like. Sure. So it depends on where the where they well everything starts with it depends right given what we do, um, but in this case it depends on where the genesis for the title comes from. If the genesis for the title comes from a desire from the publisher standpoint in order to enter into a particular market then your first round of analytics is about that market. If the genesis for it is the idea for a gameplay loop, and then you're basically trying to figure out product market fit, you start with doing com comparables analysis on games that have a similar loop. So, you know, if you were going to do a battle arena game, you'd start with everything that you could scrape about PUBG and uh, Fortnite. So, these are, these are kind of the places that you can start. And then from there, um, once you start putting together your, uh, your prototypes, be they paper or digital, then you can start to uh, um, build up a data set that will give you some sense of what's working and what doesn't when you're in that kind of discovery pre-pro uh, section. The same thing that was said earlier a whole bunch of times, that while we don't get the final say on the design, we just help designers make better choices, hopefully. Um, and exactly as Rudy's saying, Every time there's a moment in your very early discovery phase, it's like, should we have this kind of mechanic? Or maybe this is one where we don't do this. But we can tell you, hey, in your three largest competitors, these are kind of the, the behaviors there. These are the number of players. This is how it's affected their whatever. Um, we're very good at counting. We are very good at counting. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jess. I'm getting a PhD um, at Indiana University. I'm currently looking to sort of make the shift from academic to industry career. Um, so I've spent a lot of my time in academic environments, but I'm very happy to see sort of summits and conversations like this where we can have more academics and industry folks having a conversation and talking about research and sort of exchanging the knowledge. Um, but at academic conferences, I've often heard of see, um, encounter academics who are very cynical towards industry and have the perspective that industry doesn't share their data freely with academics and sort of academics kind of like, oh, you know, they don't, they're, they're not interested in sharing. And so I want to be the advocate. I want to say, well, you know, I'm making the effort to come here and as an academic to learn about the knowledge, learn about the methods, uh, have conversations among academics and industry folks. Uh, so I guess I have sort of two questions. One is when I have sort of academics who say, well, um, folks in industry don't share their data. Like they're selfish, they're only looking for money. What sort of question, or how, what, how do I sort of um, address that potential point of conflict? And secondly, are there, are there companies who are considering sharing their you know, very precious data with academics? Is that somewhere where the industry potentially might be heading. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, first, thanks. I think you will find, not just in the analytics space, but in the user research space generally, there is at least one, I don't know if it happened this year, there's like a yearly panel of like industry versus academia, and it just becomes Thunderdome up there. So, um, that's, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that happens quite constantly here, so you're among friends. Um, we are selfish. I mean, by nature of how like capitalism works, we don't want to give away. I mean, I mean, it's just it is what it is. We can't give away everything. You know, it's the kernel's sacred recipe. Sometimes we want to keep it under wraps. Uh, I will say though, there are uh, companies that have scrubbed away their identifiable data, scrubbed away their title data, and published a lot of things. Um, if there's anybody from Activision here, they have a wonderful analytics space on their like GitHub. Which is amazing, and they leave. They like put their code up. They put their their methods up. They put everything up. It's just a wonderful spot for folks to. I mean, it's it's heady and it's complex. That's one thing that's you know, it's statistics. It's math plus magic. Um, but uh, it's available, right? And I think we're getting there. Um, even in my talks, like that I've given in other places, I, I'll show up our dashboarding tools and things like that with the data scrub, you know, and it. it uh, well, we might not give you the revenue numbers, we might not give you like the code, we, we will certainly, a lot of us would be happy to share a sanitized version of it. And I mean that, that's a start, I guess. Yeah, so I, on, the, uh, on the right side, we're running into two challenges when we're reached out to by academic institutions in regards to uh, collaborating with us on, on stuff. Um, the first is that they put us in an awkward position where we want to kind of know what's going on in their study and the findings of the study can be particularly useful, but they require data that puts us on the wrong side of European privacy laws, for example. So, you know, players give us data in order to facilitate a gameplay experience and for us to then, like, pass out that data beyond the uh, kind of confines of the experience that they signed up for, um, particularly for Riot Games, where we try to play, put a lot of focus on, uh, on building trust and rapport with our player base, um, that puts us in a weird position. Um, the second is when folks approach us with kind of like, they, pr they approach us with ill-formed hypotheses that are interesting because of the size of our data set and less because they're interested in the game. So we're like, Hey, we want you to pull all this data for us and clean it for us and pull out all the PII for it and you know, basically do the project, or well, at least the first third of the project. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. We're just going to look around. Uh, so that that means that the like the time value trade off for us on the corporate side um, becomes a little bit less appealing. When folks have come to us with like, hey, we want to look at this thing. We think it can make your game better this way, and we're willing to do a lot of heavy lifting and we don't require you to, like, you know, piss off the entire European Union in the process, then, then we're into it. I feel like you also do a very good job with your API. I mean, yeah, I mean, their Riot's API makes it very easy to track player data if you're having them through a study on site, like, just get their usernames, write up some very simple code, and it'll grab all their information about the games that they have played while they're in your study, so. I feel like that's a way around all the privacy laws because they know what they're getting into. Yeah, you because know, they sign up for it and it's public data essentially. It's all already scrubbed, it's already just tied to their username, which is technically anonymous. So, um, and I used that during my, my PhD studies a little bit and it was very nice. I don't think there are any other APIs like that. At least to the best of my knowledge, where you can easily grab data from in game play and such. Um, but I feel like it's it's about right, finding the right developer um, and building a relationship with them um, instead of like reset reaching out just because you want data. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That gives me a lot of talking points. The next time someone brings up that issue, I just I, I want to add conference. that right, like academics, and I am writing from academia. They're they're not running to share their data for the most part either, right? Like I don't know if anyone's been following what's been going on, especially in the social psychology and the replicability crisis and whatever. I don't think you know most people, unless they've registered, pre-registered, or whatever, and they have to do it, are running to share their data. And on the other hand, sure, you know these are companies they do need to make money, and it's great because they actually do care about the privacy of their customers, and they don't want to just go around handing out whatever. Um, and so. 
I think the fact that you do see, sure, not everyone wants to share data, um, but there certainly are avenues out there uh, that are more than happy to collaborate. And at the end of the day, I think they want what's best for their customers, and that's why they're willing to collaborate. But they want to make sure that you know what your hypothesis is is something that can benefit. And I don't think that that at the end of the day is really any different than what's going on with academics. I think there's one little addendum that comes up, and I promise I'm going to stop this. This is a long question. I apologize. But the, um, there's a thing, you know, I used to be an academic, right? I taught at, at Penn State for a while. And you, academics have a luxury that's not afforded to the corporate world, that is the ability to sit and be really interested in something, and by virtue of only that interest, be able to interrogate it. Unfortunately, most of our interests, which we do have, are bound to a business need. You know, whether or not I'm extremely interested in, like, you know, which skins might be most popular on a particular character for a cultural or particular reason, there's not a business need for it. I can't investigate it. So sometimes they move a little slowly for us, I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I think we can get one more in. No, no, we're good. Okay, find me, find me immediately after. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.